In times when Paul Harvey was too ill to record his broadcast, he turned that responsibility over to the creator and sole writer of the rest of the story, his son, whom he called Young Paul. Here's Paul Harvey Jr. Now, the rest of the story. Say, do you ever think how long surgeons, real ones or amateurs, have been performing cesarean sections? At least 400 years and surely much longer. But it was the 20th century that introduced the big advancements in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. And in that field, one name is as distinguished as any other, if not more so. And that name is uh, Dr. Edward T. Tyler. Dr. Tyler was considered one of the world's foremost authorities on human fertility. He was among the first research scientists in the field of oral contraception. He founded and directed the Tyler Clinic and was medical director of the Family Planning Centers of Greater Los Angeles for 20 years. He was also assistant medical director of Hoffman La Roche and research director of the Orthopharmaceutical Corporation and chief of the Endocrine Clinic at Los Angeles County Harbor General Hospital and founder of one of the world's first sperm banks. Could there be more? Oh, you bet there's more. Dr. Tyler was author of more than 200 scientific papers. Did I mention that he was also associate clinical professor of medicine, obstetrics, and gynecology at the University of California School of Medicine? And did I mention that he had a full-time job, apart from anything I've mentioned so far? Oh, yes, he did. The distinguished Dr. Tyler the same pioneer researcher who told us so much about modern fertility drugs and artificial insemination and oral contraception, the same respected physician who held down a half dozen important posts in the field of medicine had since 1946 another full-time profession. Call this radio station right now if you think you know what it was. You won't win anything, but I don't think you're going to guess either. Where'd all this start? Well, Ed Tyler was still in his 20s when he became assistant medical director of Hoffman La Roche. From those years until his death in the summer of 1975, his professional life was one of amazing diversity and constant activity. He was not yet 30 when he became research director of orthopharmaceutical and then chief of the endocrine clinic at LACH General. Now, let's see, I've told you about his work in human fertility, that it was he who helped develop that which we still call the pill. For those wanting children and unable to have them, he advanced the research of his contemporaries on fertility drugs and artificial insemination. And the first anywhere sperm bank may well have been Dr. Tyler's. As an associate clinical professor at the prestigious UC Med School, he inspired innumerable young physicians to carry on his research. And when there was time for travel abroad, he lectured at medical centers in Europe, in South America, in Japan and India and Australia and Africa. And how could he manage with all those big responsibilities to write an important thesis? Much less, more than 200 such. And all the while, that distinguished researcher was making and teaching and recording medical history. He was moonlighting at yet another full-time job as a television comedy writer for Groucho Marx. Now, you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. In this episode, young Paul explained that Dr. Tyler moonlighted as a comedy writer for Groucho Marx, which he was. He wrote scripts for Groucho Marx's series, You Bet Your Life. But there's more. He also wrote for Jack Parr, Pinky Lee, and Milton Berle. It's hard to imagine a reputable doctor like Dr. Tyler working as a comedy writer for Groucho Marx. Julius Henry Groucho Marx was born in 1890. He was famous for his quick wit. He made 13 films as part of the Marx Brothers troupe. He also had a successful solo career on radio and television. His most notable role was as the host of the game show, You Bet Your Life. Now, how did that come about? Groucho's career began in vaudeville. The grease paint mustache, large glasses, 
and Large Cigar were holdovers from his time in vaudeville. In the 1930s, Groucho appeared in a dozen films. In the 1940s, his career slowed a bit, and he only appeared in five films. In March 1943, he began broadcasting a radio show called Blue Ribbon Town. At the time, a lot of radio shows were named to give maximum exposure to their sponsor. The sponsor for Blue Ribbon Town was Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer. Unfortunately, Blue Ribbon Town failed to catch on with audiences, and Groucho left the show in June 1944. Two years later, he appeared in A Night in Casablanca with his fellow Marx Brothers. In 1947, he starred in Copacabana with Carmen Miranda, Steve Cochran, and Andy Russell. In that same year, 1947, Groucho performed in a radio show with Bob Hope. Most of Groucho's dialogue was ad-libbed. John Guidel, the producer of the radio show, had been toying with the idea of a quiz show. When he saw how quick-witted Groucho was and how well he ad-libbed around Bob Hope, who stuck to a script, the producer knew Groucho was the man for the job. The producer approached Groucho about hosting the quiz show, but Groucho was less than enthused. Groucho changed his mind when the producer explained that rather than being a scripted game show, most of the show would be Groucho interviewing and reacting to contestants. Groucho became more than just host of the show. He became a 50% investor. On December 28, 1949, the first episode of You Bet Your Life was filmed as a visual test to work out the kinks before the show was broadcast on television. And here's that sterling Elgin American, the one, the only... What a ridiculous name. Oh, that's me, Groucho Marx. That episode was never aired. The show was filmed before a live studio audience so Groucho could feed off the audience. If the audience groaned at a joke, Groucho would remind them that the joke didn't cost them anything, to which they usually laughed. This episode was the first television show filmed before a live studio audience. Some television historians credit I Love Lucy with being the first filmed before a live studio audience, but I Love Lucy premiered a full year after You Bet Your Life was filmed. Sorry, Lucy. If you'd like to watch the test episode of You Bet Your Life, I'll leave a link to it in the description. The contestants for You Bet Your Life normally consisted of a male and a female selected from the live studio audience. Once selected, the contestants were quickly interviewed by the writers, one of which was Dr. Edward Tyler. The writers prepared some lines for Groucho to use along with his own improvisation. Today, game shows use a strict format and there's little time for more than an occasional ad-lib. Groucho's show was exactly the opposite. The total number of contestants in a 30-minute time frame depended solely on how much time Groucho spent in humorous conversations with each pair of guests. Now here is where the genius of Groucho Marx is most recognizable. If it was difficult for Groucho to pull something funny or interesting from a pair of guests, which was rare, or if the audience just wasn't responsive to a pair of guests, Groucho shortened the conversation with them and got to the quiz portion of the show. But when the audience was receptive to a pair of guests, Groucho kept the conversation going for a while. Without showing it, Groucho paid very close attention to the audience's reactions. They were his gauge. Now this may sound ordinary to us today, but back when You Bet Your Life began filming, it had never been done before. Now, at the beginning of the episodes, Groucho or the announcer would reveal a secret word. Well, here I am with $1,500 for one of our couples tonight. And if any of them say the secret word, Donald Duck will fly down and pay him $100. The word tonight is smile. Okay, on the Florida. <laughs> Occasionally, Groucho led the conversation in such a way that the contestants would eventually say the secret word. After the interview portion, the quiz show began. Before each of the questions, contestants would place a monetary bet that they could get the answer correct. If they answered correctly, their winnings would increase. If the contestants weren't doing so well, Groucho would usually ask really easy questions so everyone would end up winning. Some of those questions included, who is buried in Grant's tomb? When did the War of 1812 begin? 
How long do you cook a three minute egg? And what color is orange? Now these were not trick questions. Groucho wanted the contestants to win and the sponsors loved it. When contestants got those easy questions wrong, which happened when a contestant thought they were being asked trick questions, it turned into comedy gold for Groucho. In the 1950-1951 season, You Bet Your Life was in 17th place in the Nielsen rating. In 1953-54, it was in third place. Some of the contestants on the show became famous later on, such as Phyllis Diller and Ronnie Shell, who became comedians, Ray Bradbury, who became an author, and Harlan Sanders. You know him, he later became Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken fame. William Peter Blatty won $10,000 on the show and used his winnings to enable him to quit his job and support himself while he began his writing career. His most famous work was his 1971 book entitled The Exorcist. You Bet Your Life was broadcast as a television show and a radio show, both of which were successful. In the mid-1950s, quiz shows on radio and television were highly popular. Then came the quiz show scandal. In 1957, Herb Stemple, who had been a contestant on the quiz show 21 a year earlier, revealed that he had been coached to allow his opponent to win. Then a contestant on another quiz show revealed that the producers had rigged the outcome of its game as well. Then others came forward, and others, and others. In 1959, the U.S. Congress began an investigation and amended the Communications Act of 1934 to prohibit the fixing of game shows. Now, ratings from quiz shows plummeted, and You Bet Your Life ended its run in 1961. But the popularity of quiz shows rebounded. In 1980, Buddy Hackett hosted a short-lived new version of You Bet Your Life. In 1988, Richard Dawson taped a pilot episode of You Bet Your Life, but it wasn't picked up as a series. In 1992, one season of the show aired with Bill Cosby as its host. In 2021, Jay Leno hosted another new version of the show, which was successful. The show was canceled in August 2023 after the Writers Guild of America members went on strike. Now, it may seem strange that Dr. Edward Tyler, a gynecological specialist, would moonlight as a comedy writer, but this is just a testament to Dr. Tyler's genius. I've always heard that genius loves company, which would explain why Dr. Tyler began writing comedy for Groucho Marx. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And now you know the rest of the rest of the story.